dragon. Is this where the damn drumming and the music kicks in? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody, hello and welcome back to On The Pipe Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Tyler Shepardson, and today is Wednesday, September the 25th, 2024, years after zero. We are right in the pits of it all, right in the midst, the pits, whatever you want to call it, it fits. We're at the end of the season. We're getting near. Championships are being wrapped up left and right. The end of the season is coming to a close from the West Coast to the East Coast, and we are just a couple of weeks away from the international six days of Enduro happening in Galicia, 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 however you want to say it. It's in Spain, and it's going to be there in just a couple of weeks. I can't believe it has snuck up on us that fast. I, theoretically, am supposed to be going to the ISDE, but I for sure have not bought a ticket or accommodations yet so still waiting to figure out that situation but we might be coming to you live from spain here in a couple weeks i guess only time will tell we got a bunch of things to talk about we we're finally at the point where we're gonna have to address some silly season rumors that is right we usually talk about this whenever we hear about it whenever we confirm it whenever we get some things going on but uh I will say, part of this episode, we're going to talk about results, we're going to talk about racing, we're going to talk about storylines going on in the world today. At the end of the show, I'm going to talk a little bit about non-race stuff that's more show-related, more personal-related, is what it is. But a little bit of that is, since the podcast and this whole media thing has become my full-time job, it kind of changes the way that we have to approach situations. That has not been highlighted more than this year as far as discussing silly season, because there are active contracts in the works, deals being done, uh, pitches being made, media outlines, all sorts of stuff going on that kind of limits what we can say. Back when I had a job that (laughs) I could depend on, then this was, I could say whatever I wanted because it didn't affect me. I made my money during the week and I went to the races on the weekend. But now it's a little bit of a different situation because I have to play politics just a little bit. But There are some silly season rumors that we are going to address here in a little bit. We're going to talk about some racing action. We're going to talk about last week's GNCC. We're going to talk about this coming weekend's GNCC. We're going to talk about Heron Hound out on the West Coast, and we're going to talk about National Enduro that also wrapped up. Uh, Before the last episode, completely forgot to talk about the Mideast Hair Scramble, which listeners of the show know that I am the announcer of that series. Our race before this past weekend, which was the race directly before the last show or the weekend before the last show was at Wellborn Farms, which if you don't know, Wellborn Farms is in Boonville, North Carolina. And a big part of that Wellborn family is now the Russell Michael family. That is also where Ranch Russell is, where a lot of the KTM Husky and Gas Gas riders either currently train or used to train or still do train. But, um, Yeah, it's kind of that area where Caleb lives close by. Like I said, his facility is there. Lane Michael's house is actually pretty much on the property. The Wellborns themselves have a deep history of racing as well. So that is where we were racing at. Lane Michael decided to dust the cobwebs off the championship sprint enduro gas gas that he had laying around and came out and raced. And he ended up taking the win and saying that he made the pass for the lead pretty much behind his house in his backyard. So that's how that's how close it was. But that was a really cool race, a really fun race and a cool race to be a part of. Lane actually came out this past weekend and raced once again. But Brody Johnson would go on to take the win this past weekend in Morganton, North Carolina. That was another good race, good battle all the way down to the wire, but that was just some some stuff that we had going on. Like I said, we're going to talk about some racing action and some stuff going on 
in the world of off-road. But first, as always, as you guys know, this show wouldn't be possible without Beta USA. Beta Motorcycles is the official manufacturer of On The Pipe podcast. Beta Motorcycles has been family owned and operated since 1905. They're known for their premium quality and rideability. Beta Motorcycles are the only motorcycles that my butt touches. And you can head over to BetaUSA.com for more information about their available models or find a dealer near you to get yours today. This episode would also not be brought to you if it was not for our good buddy at Zach Tussle at Raymond James Financial. Zach is a racer and a financial advisor and a new father. We talk about that. Zach actually raced the Mountaineer GNCC as well. So he was out there alongside you in the woods. I don't know if you uh, happened to come upon him and ask him how the NASDAQ was doing out in the woods, but he would for sure have an answer for you. That is why he is the only financial advisor I would trust when it comes to advice for income or uh, retirement or income during retirement. You know what I mean? Check them out. Financial advisors, Denver NC.com. Hit them up on the social medias, do whatever you need to do, fill out the contact form and he can talk to you and let you know exactly how you can help you free of charge. Just let them know you listen to on the pipe podcast. And then as also, as always, DPG, Dimmers Precision Grading. They're a grading company here in the Carolinas. Any job, big or small, hit up DPG, Dimmers Precision Grading.com. They can get it done. Check them out on the socials at Dimmers Precision Grading. See some of the, the videos and clips and stuff of projects that they have going on throughout the Carolinas. So uh, if you need some grading work done, some land clearing, some demolition, anything like that, hit up Dimmers Precision Grading at Dimmers Precision Grading. Dot com. Let's get right into it. Let's start with the last GNCC that happened. Big news coming out of there. Johnny Girard is your 2024 overall GNCC champion. He ended up wrapping it up in what would be a chaotic day. It was him and Stu Baylor battling for this championship down to the wire. The first lap, first or second lap, first lap, I think. Johnny had a crash that would take off pretty much the entire clutch system on his bike. So he had to go back to the pits, replace the entire clutch system, the master cylinder, the line, the lever, all of that. So second lap, when they came by, all of a sudden we start seeing, no Johnny, where's Johnny? And that's when we found out he was actually back in the KTM pits getting his bike sorted, which opened the door for Stu Baylor to gain some very valuable, much needed points. Stu Baylor... Didn't get the best start, but started making his way through the pack the best that he could, and then ended up riding behind some riders, and then in the dust, one of the worst conditions I've ever seen for a race, just to throw that one out there. If you watched any of the videos, if you watched our YouTube video, the race recap, or you watched online, uh, however you saw anything from the race, it was dusty. And if you were there, you know exactly how it was. If you weren't there, Picture the worst dust race you've ever raced, multiply it by two, and then you would have the Mountaineer. Obviously, you can't control the weather, but up there, man, it's just, it's so silty. It's such light dirt. Like, a lot of times down here in the Carolinas or when we're racing in clay or a lot of other places for the for the fact of the matter, that dust will kind of settle. Especially if you have a breeze, it'll kind of blow it out of the way, but that dust will usually settle because it's heavier than the air. Up there, it was like a silty powdery baby powder like consistency and there was no wind so it never settled it just lingered riders would come by and there wouldn't be anyone there for a little bit and then all of a sudden it would start or or, excuse me you would look up and you would still see the dust it was just so light that it just lingered around it never really cleared out so very scary conditions especially with how rocky and gnarly that track is combine it with not being able to see you're going to have a bad time. And uh, we saw that happen for a few different riders, one of them being Stuart Baylor, who knew that Johnny was out of the race, who knew that he had a large points gap to make up, who knew he had to capitalize on this day, ended up sending it through one of the dust sections, hit a rock. The rock actually came up, put a hole in his motor, and crushed the clutch cover into the clutch basket. Therefore, his clutch was locked up, therefore his motor wouldn't turn over, therefore his bike was rendered pretty much useless. And I get the word from the woods that from from those guys that Stu was not out there, that he was back in the pits. And or no, excuse me, I actually uh, saw his mechanic Blake Poo- Poochie 
uh, out in the woods, and he said that he had a dead battery. So they were trying to locate him to get him a dead battery. He thought it was a dead battery because when he was hitting the starter button, the motor wasn't turning over, and it turned out to be because the clutch was actually bonded up against that hole and against that clutch cover in the machine. So just a rare freak accident, freak moment that would end up taking Stu out of that race. Johnny, however, got that clutch lever changed, got that clutch system changed, got back out on the track, and was able to work his way back up through the pack. Not a whole lot, but good enough because he would go out and claim. Let me double check right here. But he would get back out on track, get back riding, and there was two rounds left. So that was the third to last round. There's two more rounds left now, including the Penton this weekend, and then the Ironman that's going to be over a month from now. But uh, Johnny was able to get back in the race and get all the way up to the 12th place position. Now, keep in mind, XC1 is not scored on XC1 points. It's scored on overall points. If you do not finish in the top 20, you do not get overall points. So for Johnny to be completely off the track, replace that entire clutch system, get back out there, and charge all the way up into the number 12 spot. That got him enough points to put himself more than 60 points over Stuart Baylor and claim the national championship for the year. So what a nail-biter it was. Really, at the finish line, like no one really knew that he had wrapped it up. Like Everyone's sitting there with phones out doing math and calculations and trying to figure out what was going on. But at the end of the day, when the dust settled four hours later, Johnny Girard would be crowned the 2024 GNCC National Champion. Talking with Johnny at the time, it was like it still hadn't set in yet, but he was so stoked to realize he had gotten it done because especially, like I said, when you're off the track that early, you're doing the math in your head trying to figure out, can I do it today? And so it kind of took a little bit for everyone to realize, yeah, that 12th place finish got you enough points to push you over 60 to take home that championship so Johnny Girard one of the guys that for the past several years ever since he moved up into that XC1 class was in more than one instance my my pick for the championship just due to the level that he can ride at but the question has been in the past will he be able to stay healthy throughout an entire season this year he gets it done he stays healthy he wraps up that championship and uh gets it done and to to know the story and to know where he came from and uh, to know all of the hurdles that he's had to got get over to get to this point makes it even that much more impressive. So huge congratulations to Johnny Girard for getting it done out there. But that would not be the only story of the day. Jordan Ashburn is a guy that we have seen compete in the final of the TKO, the Grand, or excuse me, yeah, was it? Do they call it the Grand National? Whatever. The National Hard Enduro Championship at the TKO Enduro in Tennessee. We've seen him in the finals. We know that Jordan is a technical rider. Jordan won the Battle of the Goats Extreme Hard Enduro. Just a few weeks ago, he was racing at the TKO. Just a few weeks ago, he was on the podium of a GNCC. And now, Jordan Ashburn comes back out and chases down Mike Wachowski to get the pass and never looked back to go on to take, I believe, his third or fourth win of his career. Uh, We saw him battle down to the wire in Tennessee. That was a race that was local to him. So to see him come back and get that win this year uh, was really cool as well. Huge uh, hometown crowd for Jordan Ashburn as he was um, coming through there. And I say hometown. I guess in hometown I'm thinking more of the riding conditions. It it suited Jordan's style. So he was getting a lot of cheers as he was coming through and as I was chasing him around the track. But uh, he goes out there and gets the overall win. But before that, he did have to make a push because – The very first lap, I went from the starting line, and I tried to haul the mail to get to around the seven-mile marker, which is where the PowerPoint Hill was. There was a a hill climb, very remote section of the woods. That place is so hard to get around. It is the easiest, hardest place to get around that I can think of in any, any race's history. And I say the easiest, hardest place to get around because there are roads everywhere. There are roads and trails that can get you anywhere you need to go. The hard part is that there are roads and trails everywhere, and you have no idea where they go. 
So when you're back in those woods, man, everything looks the same. There's a trail going in every direction. There's roads going in every direction. And the track is so spread out. If you look at the track map for the Mountaineer GNCC, you'll see that it never really gets close to itself. It's a big, giant loop where a lot of these races, they'll kind of double back and get close where the three-mile marker will be next to the nine-mile marker. So you can get them at both locations and then maybe throw in another couple ones around there um, just for, for good measure. But this one... It was really hard to get from one part of the track to another part of the track, so it kind of limited the approach that I had to take to get the video and to get as many shots as we were able to get. But be that being said, rather than trying to get them around the three or four mile marker and then risk not being able to make it to the seven, I went straight from the start to the seven mile marker, where is this giant, it's not a giant hill. It was a pretty big hill, and it was pretty rutted out, and it was very, 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 very silty and Rudy. And so I was like, I want to be there. They're still probably going to be bunched together. And it's probably the toughest, the first toughest obstacle that they're going to come to. So that's where I went, rode out into the woods, got to there and all of a sudden start hearing some bikes coming through the woods and then get closer. And I only hear one bike coming through the woods. And then around the corner comes a red bike through the woods. And then he gets next to me and it is Mike Wachowski on the 235, I do believe. Uh, that was actually the, the, First one there, so 282, I don't know, 235 Brody Johnson, that was this past weekend, sorry, got confused, red bike, two something, you know what I mean, but the 282 of Mike Wachowski is really no one in sight, comes up through the, through the hill, cleans it, goes out around the corner, pan all the way back to the bottom of the hill where I can first see him coming into the track, and still no sign of anybody, and I'm like, geez, Mikey's out here rolling. At the bottom of the hill and out of the corner was Jordan Ashburn in the number two spot. So keep in mind, Mikey is already up the hill and around the corner and out of sight before Jordan Ashburn gets there. And then there was there was a good gap. I didn't have a stopwatch on it, but it felt like 30 seconds or more be, before the rest of that lead pack got there. So those two guys both ran out there and uh, got out to an early start, an early lead. And uh, Mike Wachowski was looking to have a good day. He actually um, led the first lap, and the time there was 11 seconds, so it got tightened up a little bit through uh, through the rest of the, the track there, but then hung in there in the number two spot until the final lap where I'm not sure. I, I think I don't know if he went down or something happened, but he went from second to fourth in uh, in the last lap out there. So, yeah. What a good day of racing. Speaking of a good day of racing, another rider that continues to impress is the number two rider of Liam Draper. Liam Draper, the reigning XC2 champion, has made his way up into the XC1 class, as we all know. And 
there, there's no way that we don't know because he's managed to put himself on the podium in his first two races on the big bike. And he talked about it on the podium, said that he loves riding the 450 a lot more rather than wringing the 250's neck out, trying to get every bit of power that you can out of it. And uh, that goes to, to prove to be true in his riding that we've seen here over the past couple of races. So Liam Draper with a second place finish on that Yamaha, getting it done. And then in the number three spot is a name that is very familiar with this program. He's a friend of the show. He is a North Carolina local. But one name that we have not been saying a lot on the podium here in a while, I think two years even, was Trevor Bollinger. Trevor Bollinger, one of those guys on the bubble trying to look for a ride for next year, trying to make things happen, trying to prove he can stay healthy and prove that he can get those results. He's had a couple good showings at the National Enduros, and now he comes back out to GNCC Racing and gets it done. Finishes the day third place overall on the overall podium, on the XC1 podium, and Nowadays, it's an even bigger accomplishment to say you made it onto that overall podium because Grant Davis clicking off an overall win. Grant Davis clicking off multiple overall podiums. Grant Davis was the closest person besides Bollinger to being on that overall podium and talking with him sounded like he actually went down at the finish line, like with the finish line in sight. Went down, had to pick his bike up, get back going again, and that might have been the difference in the time. It was only two seconds between Trevor Bollinger and Grant Davis for that final overall podium position. So Trevor Bollinger able to nudge him out and take that podium spot, which XC1 podium would have been sweet. That overall podium makes it even sweeter for Trevor Bollinger. He came through and just the sign of relief. That is the the best way I can describe it, just the relief that seemed like it overwhelmed Bollinger. He actually came through the scoring line and ghost rode his bike off into the banners and then followed his bike, went and sat down next to it, which we got on camera as well. So um, if you haven't yet watched the YouTube video from the Mountaineer, it is up on our YouTube channel. You can see that conversation and uh, see Bollinger coming through and looping, or not looping the bike out, but ghost riding the bike and just that uh, that overwhelming sense of relief that we're talking about. So that is your top three XC1 and top three overall riders. Jordan Ashburn took the win. Liam Draper in the number two spot. And Trevor Bollinger with a third place finish on the day. In the XC2 class, we mentioned Grant Davis, the points leader. Grant Davis, the guy that took the world by storm this year. He would click off yet another XC2 win. He was close to wrapping up the title, didn't quite get it done, but has the potential to wrap up that XC2 title this year. And when he got up on the podium and kind of the, the word that we're hearing is that we might not see Grant Davis defend the number one plate in the XC2 class. It sounds like all things are pointing towards him moving straight into the XC1 class. He said, hey, boys, I've won one of these races before. I've been on the overall podium. I ride in that XC2 lead pack every single race just about. I think it's time to get off the, the small bore and get onto the big bike. So it does seem like it is trending towards Grant Davis. If he can wrap up this championship moving into that XC1 class, will we see him in the XC1 class at Ironman? I guess that is yet to be determined, but Grant Davis, we, we've talked about him several times this year, took all the way until Ironman last year to get an XC2 podium, and then he came in this year swinging and shocked, I think, everybody, maybe everybody but himself, by the results that he has been able to get this year. He has been on the XC2 podium at every single round this year. He has won seven races, one, two, three, three, four, five, six, seven races this year. So Grant Davis, what a turnaround from last year to this year. Um, a dominant run this year by Grant Davis in that XC2 class. And if he does move up to XC1, what a treat we are all in for next year. The biggest and probably most decorated XC1 class that we've ever seen all happening right in front of us. We've talked about, we. I mean, we went through the years of four riders in XC1, five riders in XC1, and like 30 riders in XC2. And now we've seen this transition of so many XC2 riders that have made their one made their way into the XC1 class. Grant Davis coming off of an excellent XC2 year. If he moves straight into that XC1 class, it's only going to make it that much more competitive along with, well, maybe some other stuff that we're going to talk about here in a minute about that XC1 class. You know what I mean? 
So, uh, yeah, Mike Wachowski would end the day fifth place overall after a great ride of his own, Evan Smith in sixth. Nick DeFeo in the 258 class, seventh place overall. We talked about Nick several times this year. Nick has been on the program earlier this year because of his impressive results. Last race, we saw him wrap up the 258 championship. That gets four drops for those amateur classes. This past weekend, or excuse me, yeah, last week, the weekend before last, the Mountaineer GNCC, we saw him get a seventh place finish, another 250A class win, and that would wrap up the overall amateur championship for the year. So overall amateur gets two drops, but all the amateur classes get four drops. Nick needed that one, just two races left. He wraps it up in the perfect amount of time you need 11 races he did it in 11 races and we will i believe see him on an xc2 machine this weekend he is another guy that could not wait to get to the xc2 class he don't want to stay in 250a i if i'm willing to bet he probably didn't want to race 250a this year i think he actually said that on the show so i don't think that's privileged information but He's excited to get that XC2 class, and he can prove that he can compete. He would have been second place in XC2 starting from the 250A row, which this past weekend or this past race with all of the dust made it that much harder for him to charge into that number seven spot. He actually led the, or no, he was third place overall there for a couple laps, so be excited to see Nick DeFeo in the second row and be able to get some clean air and see what he is able to do with the XC2 boys. The second place XC2 rider did go to Cody Barnes, um, who had a fantastic ride of his own. And then Jonathan Johnson on a beta factory racing beta machine would go out and grab the final podium position. It was a battle that came down to the wire over him and his brother Brody Johnson, who we saw them under the same tent, under that same beta rig. For a little while this year, Brody Johnson now back on a privateer Honda program was running in that number three spot and I think blew his bike up on the last lap. So Brody Johnson putting together a solid ride, but it would be Jonathan Johnson on the two smoking beta that would end up in the number three spot, the final XC2 podium rider of the day. Take a look at the XC3 class, and it was none other than another beta machine, Jack Walker, going out and taking the win. That is a battle that is within a couple of points of each other, and it is going to come down to these last two rounds of who is going to win that championship. Will it be Jack Walker? Will it be Dakota DeVore? Jack Walker started early with a few wins. Dakota DeVore has taken over the class since then. Jack Walker gets back out in front. He is your overall points leader, but when you factor in drops, I think he's actually down four or five points. So that's why I said this one's going to come down to the wire. We're going to need these last two races to determine our XC3 champion. Jack Walker back in the win column, though, and Dakota DeVore in the number two spot. And then good friend of the program, the Fran favorite, Dustin Simpson, would hold on for a third place ride overall out there. So now we move to our WAC class, the morning race going on in the morning. Brandy Richards, one of the most accomplished ISDE women's riders in history, goes out there battling with Rachel Archer. This pod or this battle for the WXC championship is still very close. Um, Rachel Archer does have a little bit of a lead, but with Brandy Richards going out and taking the win at the last round, that's actually going to drop one of her worst finishes of the year. So that means Brandy Richards is not only getting points for the win, she's actually dropping a seventh place finish on the year. Those WXC and XC3 riders get two drops on the season. So Brandy Richards not only gets that five point bump from first to second, but she also throws out a seventh place finish and replaces it with a third, I think, at the in the grand scheme of things. Um, cause, oh, excuse me, a fourth. Because now she'll have a fifth and a fourth. So she can get on the podium again. She's going to drop that five, and her worst finish will be a fourth, which is a huge points swing. So that is the way that it shakes up. Rachel Archer was uh, battling back and forth. That was a, a tight battle between those two ladies. Brandy Richards would end up making a pass there on the last lap. I think, oh, Rachel Archer actually had a crash there on that last lap. She went straight from the checkered flag to the SOS medical tent with Dr. Tanner to get herself looked out, looked at. Obviously, she was fine because she went out and won the National Enduro this past weekend and wrapped up that championship. But 
a brief little scare there after she went down on the last lap. Brandy Richards will take over the lead and get it done. Rachel Archer in the number two spot. And then Preston Reigns would grab her second podium finish of the year with a third place spot. Corey Steed still nursing a shoulder injury. She was the one closest to Rachel in the points. She was one point ahead of Brandy Richards heading into this one. But Corey Steed... She's been vocal about it on the podium. She, I can't remember if it was separated or dislocated her shoulder, but very clearly still having some some drawbacks from that, that shoulder pain making it hard to ride, especially in those tough and technical conditions that were out there last weekend. She would hold on for fourth place and another couple of weeks to rest to hopefully get back in this thing and get back in the fight as we head into the final two rounds of GNCC racing. So that is how that wrapped up. We are going to fast forward a week and talk about the national enduro that just took place this past weekend in Oklahoma. That is right. Every national enduro post that you've seen either had Oklahoma smoke show or that Oklahoma ain't no love in Oklahoma by Luke Bron- Luke Combs, excuse me. Um, so yeah, a lot of, lot of Oklahoma themed music this past weekend. And that is because they were racing at the zinc ranch down in Oklahoma where Josh Toth would go on to get the win. I believe there was some controversy. I think a test got thrown out when it looked at the results throughout the day. There was a time where Grant Davis was in the overall lead. There was all sorts of crazy stuff going on, but five tests ran for the pro riders. Uh, so one test inevitably was thrown out. So it scored off of those five tests. Josh Toth would go out and get yet another national enduro victory of the year and wrap up that national enduro championship. So Josh Toth, one of the coolest schedules of anyone out there making a living to ride a dirt bike. He's raced a little bit of everything. He's been to Hawaii to race. He's raced hard enduro. He's raced moto. He raced at Southwick. He's raced J days. He won a GNCC and set GNCC history by winning it from the second row. He raced several GNCCs this year, but the one series that he has competed for in points was that National Enduro Series where he's had a dominant run this year, and he takes it away from Stuart Baylor Jr. And one of the interesting things to note about that, I think it is eight consecutive years in a row that the National Enduro champion had the last name of Baylor. Between Stu Baylor and his five championships, Grant Baylor and his three championships, I do believe, Josh Toth is the first one to disrupt the family name and get in there and take a National Enduro title. A solid battle between those two riders throughout the day, but Stuart Baylor would come home in the number two spot, won the last test of the day, trying to, to put or to gain that ground there but at the end of the day was 22 seconds off of Josh Toth's pace after the five tests were added up. Ricky Russell on the Yamaha would go out and have a good day after we saw him with a little bit of a scary situation at the Mountaineer um, GNCC where his knee either locked up or wouldn't bend. We saw it on camera. They were messing with his knee trying to get it to bend. They interviewed him. It was a pretty scary situation there, but obviously looks like that thing is back up and going because Ricky Russell would ride his way to a podium finish in that Pro 1 class. Um, I know I'm getting off on tangents, but real quick before we get to that, another injury from the Mountaineer GNCC that could play a role in things that we have to come. Craig DeLong, I believe it was his hand or his wrist. He had a crash, ended up breaking a bone in his hand or his wrist. I think he already did have surgery on it, but Craig DeLong is one of those World Trophy team riders that is supposed to be competing in Spain in just a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks ago, we saw Dante Oliveira break his collarbone where he would get it plated up and then leave it to wonder, hey, is he going to be good to go? That was probably more than a month ago. Craig DeLong coming fresh off of this Mountaineer GNCC, fresh off of a surgery, will be able to make it to Spain and help go out there with that US or USA ISDE team as they look to repeat as champions and build on that success that they built from last year. Hopefully, he will be able to be good to go and uh, compete over there in Spain. But back to the Zinc Ranch in the number two spot, Will Steven Piper on that RM Red Bear racing team would go out and get his first ever 
Pro 2 class victory with a fifth place finish overall. So shout out Will Stephen Piper putting de- putting together consistent times throughout the day, able to hold on and get it done and grab his first win. He's had a lot of success in that Pro 2 class this year. Put it all together and grabbed the win in that Pro 2 class. Nick DeFeo, we saw him in that Pro 2 class as well. He would end the day second place on the day. And then Bubs Tasha rounding out your Pro 2 National Enduro Podium this past weekend in Oklahoma. Taking a look down at the women's elite class, Rachel Archer clean swept them, won all four scoring tests of the day to wrap up that women's elite National Enduro title. Shelby Turner in the number two spot, and then Preston Reigns, what do you know it, back-to-back podium weekends, podium at Mountaineer GNCC, podium at the Zinc Ranch National Enduro. So that's how things shook up out there. Also, last weekend, the weekend of the GNCC, there was another round of the AMA National Hare and Hound Series. So we're going to talk about that real quick, go over those results, because out in front, what do you think it was? It was premium quality and rideability. It was a Beta USA factory racing beta machine of Zane Roberts extending his pro class points lead on the way to this National Hare and Hound Championship. He got the win last weekend at the Trail Blazers Hare and Hound. So Zane Roberts take the win. Preston Campbell on the JCR Honda. Got to meet Preston out at the Vegas Torino race. Super cool dude. Got to actually talk with him for quite a bit. Um, he spent some time on the East Coast, raced a couple GNCCs, but he is a desert racer by family tradition. Obviously, the son of Johnny Campbell which is the JC in JCR, Johnny Campbell Racing Honda. Preston Campbell goes out there, has a solid ride at Vegas to Reno. Got to talk with him quite a bit about that, which was super cool. He goes out and has a solid round at Heron Hound as well in that number two spot. And then rounding out the pro class podium was Giacomo Ridandi getting it done on the gas gas machine out there. We take a look at our pro two class, Chance Fullerton, would go out on the Kawasaki and take the Pro 2 class victory out there. DJ Weber in the number two spot. And rounding out your Pro 2 Heron Hound podium was Alexandru Trapp. So that is the way that it shook up out there. And then we'll check in with our women's riders at the, the Heron Hound. It was Ty Woolslayer that would take the women's Pro class victory out there. In the number two spot was Brittany Gallegos, and then Rachel Stout would end the day with a third place finish. Rachel Stout in the points lead, but just six points ahead of Ty Woolslayer as they head into these uh, the, to the end of this season. But Rachel Stout third on the day, first in the point standing. Ty Woolslayer gaining some much needed points in that championship battle. As we mentioned, just six points away is all that the gap is. Zane Roberts, 16 points up on Austin Walton. Austin Walton moved into the lead, but would end up having some issues that would drop him off of the podium, giving Zane Roberts some of those much-needed points as uh, as we near the end of the season out here at the Hare and Hound and across the country with everything that we have going on. So that is going to do it for um, the race results want to get back to the Johnny Girard championship thing and it's kind of lead into some of the other uh, pressing issues uh, throughout the off-road world. When you look at the champions of the last four years, ever since Caleb Russell retired after 2020, Ben Kelly would go on to win the championship the following year with three race wins. The next year, Jordan Ashburn would go on to get his first career win, second career win, win the championship with two race wins. Last year, we saw Craig DeLong wrap up the championship with three race wins, and now Johnny Girardi, 2024 champion, wrapped up the championship. Obviously, two rounds left of racing to go, so Johnny could certainly add to this list. Would not be surprised at all if he does that, but as it stands right now, four race wins on the day. And we went through those eight years of Caleb Russell dominance. And there's no other way to say it than dominance. There were some people that were right there. Thad Duvall, one of them. Thad Duvall was the one pushing Caleb to the max. Obviously, some people snuck off some wins in there. Chris Bach got him a win in there. You know what I mean? Trevor Bollinger got him a win in there. Josh Strang got him some wins in there. Stuart Baylor got him some wins in there. 
there was some parity throughout the races, but when you look at the overall standpoint of it, you look at the race wins, and that's kind of why I, I wanted to just kind of look at something because this has been the most competitive that we have ever seen GNCC racing. So, in by no way am I taking this away from anyone because to me, after the year that Ben won the championship, he came out the next year and won six straight. And they were like, okay, we're looking at another dominant KTM rider. Obviously, everyone knows how that story turned out. Ben ends up breaking his leg. And uh, that is the year that Jordan Ashburn would go on to claim the title. And that was a lot of stuff happened. But um, you look back at it. And while I think it is good for the fans, it is good for all of us that are watching these races to go out there and say, who do you think is going to win? And I give my answer. And who do you think is going to win? You give your answer. And who do you think you going to win? And our friend gives their answer. And any one of us could be right. Any one of us could be right. Because anybody could go out there and win, and that is the level that we are at. There is a obvious gap between the best and then the next guys, but that pool of the best is the largest that we have ever seen it right now. It is the most competitive that it has ever been, and these have been some of the hardest-earned championships that I think there has been in, in recent memory. But it did go back to show, remember those days when – we are showing up to the racetrack going, who you think's going to get second? <laughs> because we all kind of had in the back of our mind, like, Caleb's going to win. And so I want to start things out back in 2012. Looking at Caleb Russell, that was the year that he ended up second place in the championship points to Paul Wibley. Paul Wibley won four races that year. So Johnny Girard won the championship this year with four races. The last person... Um, before Caleb's run was Paul Wibley, who won it with four races. Caleb Russell won five races that year. But, obviously, a couple of, of mishaps, and that was actually a battle that came down to the wire. That was a really close one. But, yeah, Caleb Russell, five wins in 2012. Paul Wibley wins a championship with four race wins. 2013, Caleb Russell wins seven races, doesn't race one of them. So, one less start, seven race wins. 2014, nine race wins. And that is after he came out, started the season with a 14th place finish. And then would go on to win nine races throughout that year. 2015, eight races. But he didn't even race three races. Three races is 25% of the season. And he still clicked off eight wins. 2016, ten wins. Only three races that year that Caleb Russell didn't win. 2017, seven race wins. 2018, seven race wins, didn't race one. 2019, six race wins, didn't race two races. And his final year, 2020, seven races, seven race wins, and didn't race two of those races. And it was just one of those things that as I was looking at it and as I'm looking at the past champions, I kind of thought to myself and I made a little note, look up Caleb's race wins. Because that was another level. Ten race wins in a 13-race season. Nine race wins, eight race wins, seven race wins. And doing it for eight years straight is impressive. And I just wanted to, like I said, bring that up and kind of see. Because on one hand, you can see the level that Caleb Russell pushed himself to to get those types of numbers. A lot of those same guys racing now are the same guys racing then. But as I mentioned, for us as fans... The parody of it all kind of is one of the most exciting things about it. We don't know who's going to win. We don't know who's going to have a good day. And now Liam shows up and gets on the podium two straight rounds. And Stu Baylor is always a threat for a race win. I wouldn't be surprised if Stuart Baylor wins everything for the rest of the year. I'm just being honest with you. Both the championships are wrapped up. National Enduro got wrapped up this weekend. GNCC got wrapped up last weekend. Now that takes the pressure off. Stu Baylor is a guy that we have seen with an immense amount of pressure. I don't think that we can look back in history and see someone that's had more pressure on him than Stu has had these past couple years trying to start a team, trying to run a team while being the premier rider, while being the rider that's selling sponsorships for that, both off his name, image, likeness, and who he is as a competitor, and also being the one at the negotiation table doing it. Not to mention nine riders under that tent. And Stu Baylor is accounting for them all. He's lining up 
the logistics. He's lining up the brace bikes, the practice bikes, the parts, the riders, the meals. Stu Baylor is cooking on Fridays and Saturday nights at the GNCCs after pedaling the track, coming back when it's dark out to have a team dinner that most of the time he has been cooking while going out and trying to be one of the best riders in the world. But now both of those championships are wrapped up. That is the pressure. That is what they ride for. That is what everyone's goal is. And now that pressure is gone. So when you look at so many things that he has spread out throughout his mind and everything that he has to accomplish, and now you take away the two main goals, and that is National Enduro Championship and GNCC Championship. That, I think, in some way, and this is not coming from Stu. I haven't talked to Stu about this, and I could be completely wrong about it. But that takes those two biggest pressures off your shoulders. And now you're racing for win bonuses, and you're racing for next year, and you're racing for some solid results to finish out this year. I would not be surprised... If Stu Baylor comes out and wins GNCC this weekend, wins the next National Enduro, wins the next GNCC, wouldn't surprise me one bit. Because now that pressure is gone and he can get back to riding his dirt bike the way he knows how. So, I don't know. Random side note, just possible prediction uh, for the for the rest of the season. But, um, yeah. I forgot where I was going with all of this. Let's take a moment to gather our thoughts. But, uh, yeah, just just looking back at the past couple years, and that leads me into one of the biggest silly season rumors in history. It has to be the biggest silly season rumor in history. And I've purposely avoided it on the program for quite some time now. And by quite some time, I mean several months. And that is because of some of the reasons that we talked about at the beginning of the show. The politics, the relationships, all of that. But now it has become so widespread that I feel like I I can address it to a certain extent. Um, There have been rumors, and now it's getting posted on the GNCC page. It's getting posted in the Mideast Racing Group. It's getting, I think, uh, Vital MX even said something about it. It keeps coming out in in roundabout places that we could be seeing a return from the guy we just talked about. The guy that had eight dominant years in a row, but on a different color. And that is the craziest thing of them all. And when Zach Osborne came to GNCC Racing, that was, to me, one of the biggest silly season rumors of all time. And if you guys remember throughout that episode in that time period... When we were talking about the other Silly Season rumors is when I kind of mentioned, oh, hey, I've been hearing from some people that would be in the know that Zach Osborne is coming to GNCC to race a Yamaha. But that is just so silly and so ridiculous that I wouldn't even think that it was true. And then next thing you know, I get blown up by several people of, why are you telling everybody that? Why'd you go out and say that? Why are you putting it out there? So I I really thought the Zach Osborne thing was a joke until I said it out here and got yelled at for... Uh, breaking the news when at the time I didn't even know it was news. That's the only reason I even brought it up. Talked about it several times. When we find information, we do our vetting. We confirm with multiple sources from multiple different areas and multiple people that would be in the know before I even think about bringing it out there. But that one just felt so silly and so untrue that it could no way be true. And that is the only reason I said it. I said it in that context. Like, hey, heard this, but there's no way it can happen. And then next thing you know, I'm getting yelled at for talking about it. But One of the biggest things that we've seen is the possible return of Caleb Russell to GNCC aboard, from what everyone is saying on the internet, a Yamaha. And this would be some of the craziest news to ever shake the world of off-road. You're talking about the most wins of all time at a GNCC. Eight consecutive championships, almost nine. Returning on a bike that's different from the bike that he has rode since he was on mini bikes all throughout his career has been a career KTM guy from the very beginning to the very end. He signed his last contract and said, I want to make sure I finished my career with KTM since I've been with them my entire life. And now you're seeing rumors posted all over the place that there could be a possible return and he could possibly be on a different brand. And that is news 
that could shake up the whole history of the sport. I think Caleb is two championships away from the all-time championships list, but retired at a time where he was 31 years old, still in his prime, still winning races, ending with seven races and just sitting out the last two. Could have been nine, could have been eight, definitely was seven. And, uh, yeah, it's one of those things that, if it was true, I'm not going to go on record and confirm or deny. All I can do is say that it has been the rumor circulating online. Everywhere you look now, you see people talking about it. You hear people talking about it in the pits. So if it is true, one of the craziest things to ever happen to the sport, without a doubt. And, um, yeah, it's one of those things where I didn't want to get on that rumor mill early on, but now it's kind of thrown everywhere. And, like I said, the the post that went kind of big in the GNCC group about it, and now there's another YouTube video and post going pretty big about it right now. Um, I don't know. It's weird being the guy breaking news and then seeing – all the other stuff going online about it, I don't know what I'm getting at. I don't know what I'm trying to do here. But if it is true, it throws a whole wrench into everything. It, it's going to be a completely different dynamic, um, potentially. And I had, I don't know. It's interesting to see all the places that it is coming from. I guess we'll have to sit and wait and see for more information as it progresses. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> other than that, that is uh, that is just about going to wrap up this week's episode of On The Pie Podcast. Um, yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. If you listen this far, then you're probably guys that, that listen to the show on a weekly basis uh, when it is out there on a weekly basis. Um, when I came back after that, that long time off that I talked about, uh, I, I kind of wanted to address some things, but then again, I kind of didn't just because it was like kind of act like nothing happened or do I talk about it? Um, there's been times where I actually get yelled at in the past, get emailed in the past, get, uh, people talking junk because of the inconsistency, even, um, friends, people close to me kind of rag on it a little bit. Or when I, when I talk about myself on here and, um, that kind of makes it tough, but it's kind of a, a mixed edge because I created this thing. It's been seven years now, eight years now. And I understand that when we started this, there was nothing like it. Since we've done it, there's been people that have tried to do it, and then they always flame out. So this has been the longest standing, the original and the longest standing of of doing what we do. And as a fan of the sport, if I was not involved with On The Pipe podcast – and there was someone like myself, I would be pretty disappointed and I would be pretty upset and it would drive me nuts because I've talked about it before on here. I talk about, or I listen to Pat McAfee every day of my life, literally every day of my life. Pat McAfee was a punter for the Colts. He is now probably the biggest name in sports news, sports media. He's on ESPN every day. I watch him on YouTube every day. I've been watching him on YouTube every day since 2019. And when I say every day, I mean, since 2019, There has not been a day where I did not watch the entirety of the Pat McAfee show every day. And then sometimes he'll take vacation. So after football season, they go on a week or two long vacation. And then every now and then they'll do days where they go on vacation. And those days and those time periods and those weeks, it it disrupts my entire day. Because literally when I when I was working my safety job, I listened to it in the truck on YouTube between job sites every day and now it's part of my daily routine to listen to it doing the various things that I'm doing I have it on in the background or go do something and have it on mow the lawn have it on I listen to it every day and those days where it's not on or the times that they take vacations or times they take day off it literally disrupts my days like I don't even know what I'm doing like how can I do this with myself um in 2000 I don't know probably 16 to 19 I couldn't tell you who won the Super Bowl I would see pictures of Patrick Mahomes on the internet and look think he looked like a 17-year-old high schooler and there's no way he's in the NFL. Like, couldn't tell you any players. I would kind of keep up with the Packers 
record, but I wouldn't watch any games. Didn't know anything about the NFL. And now Pat McAfee is so entertaining and his friends are so entertaining and they present it in such a way that I would start seeing the clips and then I started listening to the full shows. And now, dude, I could tell you third string guys on pretty much every NFL team. I can name every NFL head coach. I can name every storyline in the NFL, everyone's records, who's doing good, who's doing bad. Um, and that all started because Pat McAfee is so entertaining. I enjoy listening to it so much. So what I'm getting at is this is a very small world. This is a very tight knit community. This is a very niche sport. And for the people that are in it, you are all the way in it. There is nobody that is halfway in this sport. If you are in this sport, you are spending hundreds of dollars every weekend to drive a few hours and spend a few hundred dollars to go race. And it is cool that I've built this platform into the largest news source for off-road and kind of the only ones doing what we're doing as far as the video, the coverage, the social media, the podcast, and all of that. And so I completely understand your frustrations when every Tuesday night or Wednesday morning or even Monday night or Tuesday morning when you're used to seeing the show and you want to hear what happened over the weekend and you want to catch up on the gossip and you want to catch up on the news and you look and there's no new shows. I understand your frustration. Because I get it. I would get just as frustrated. If I wasn't the one doing this and I was relying on this for my information, I would be very upset. And that weighs on me. That weighs on me a lot. Um, It really does. And I know we didn't do a show last week, and that's kind of what sparked this whole thing. And the, the two sides of the coin is like I'm proud of this thing that I've built. But also, like I said, get afraid to kind of talk about things, especially after some of the emails and some of the feedback of, of people telling me to not talk about me, no one cares about me, people just care about racing. That kind of, every show that I do, that actually goes through my mind and I actually overthink it quite a bit. But at the same time, like, I've built this following and um, I guess part of me wants to use this platform that I've built to talk about whatever I want to talk about without fear of getting reprimanded or without fear of the negativity. But then part of me also understands that, like, hey, this isn't for me. This is for these off-road riders and the the people in the off-road world. But then the other side of me, the third side, is you guys have invested your time into listening to this. And that is why I didn't want to talk about it at the beginning like I normally do. Because if you made it this far in the show, you typically listen to all the shows. And so you're really the people that I'm talking to, the people that hear that I talk junk about someone one week so they get on to listen to that one soundbite and get off, don't apply to them. But the people that are listening to all of these shows and listening to this point in a random show um, and giving me another chance after taking another week off and then coming back and, and listening to the show, you guys, you are the ones that I'm that I'm speaking to with this. And so the that third part of me is that even though I'm kind of afraid to talk about myself on here for fear of no one caring or fear of people getting upset um I also feel like I know I owe everybody an explanation as far as why you get used to listening to these shows and then all of a sudden they disappear and um yeah so it's kind of a, a double-edged sword on, on what to do in that situation but I mean, to be completely blunt, like I, and I believe I've talked about it before on here, like I, I deal with depression. Um, and it kind of feels weird saying that. I don't know if I've ever directly said that on the show because I just felt incredibly weird when I just said that <laughs> into a microphone right now. But, um, I do, I, I deal, I deal with depression quite heavily. Um, and I always have. And I think I've realized now. I kind of lock myself up and I shut everybody off, shut everybody out. And um, I, I go to the races and, and people that I don't know talk to me and people that I do know talk to me and people that I don't quite recognize talk to me. And um, I always feel weird in those exchanges. Like if you talk to me at the races, you probably went away from that conversation. Like that was kind of an awkward exchange. And um, that bothers me a lot too. But then I also talk to like all my really good buddies at the races. And so sitting and thinking about it like one of the things that I figured out is I'm kind of a recluse I'm 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 a very extroverted introvert when I'm in those situations when I'm announcing races when I'm at the races when I'm doing a show when 
I have to be somebody, it's easy for me to turn that on. But outside of that, I don't want to talk to anybody <laughs> most most times. And a lot of it is related to that depression. And that's why it is so hard to, to talk about this. And honestly, can't believe that I actually am talking about it. But I go through the races and like all day Friday, just nonstop interaction all day Saturday, nonstop interaction all day Sunday, nonstop interaction. And keep in mind, this isn't just GNCC weekends. I announced for the Mideast hair scramble. So that's every other weekend. So 16 Mideast, 13 um, GNCCs, that's 29 race weekends. Plus you throw in Vegas to Reno, you throw in ISDE, you throw in all these things. This is how I live Monday through Thursday completely shut off from the world and then Friday through Sunday completely overstimulated with people everywhere at all times and um a lot of times I get to the point where like Monday and Tuesday like I'm I'm so everything happened over the weekend that I just want to go sit in a box and not talk to anybody and so I get so excited at these races like first and foremost I am a giant fan of this sport I love every single one of these riders. I love every single one of these storylines. Like, while I'm filming throughout the races, I'm like, oh, man, like, I got to talk about this. I got to talk about that. I got to do this. got to do that. And, um, but then, like, Monday comes, I don't want to talk to anybody. And people call me on my phone, I don't answer. People text me, I don't text back. People message me, I don't message back. If you message the OTP Facebook, first of all, I can't even figure out how to read those messages, so I never respond. But then the OTP Instagram, like, it'll probably be three or four days before I respond to you. And most of the time when I do respond, it is on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday when I'm back into race mode and back into social mode. And, um, yeah, I can't tell you how many times, like, <laughs> even friends, family, brother, sister, mom, dad, people call me and I, I just don't answer. And um, that kind of weighs on me. So then when it when it goes to reaching out to riders to put together a show to do interviews. It's like, I don't want to talk to the closest people to me. And so it's hard to set up a time to talk to, um, other people. And then even sitting here talking to myself, like a lot of times it, it's difficult for me. And a lot of times, like, I don't, I don't have other things going on. Like I can do the show whenever I can do it at eight in the morning. I can do it at eight at night. I can do it at two o'clock in the morning. I can do it at five o'clock in the afternoon. But I just get so far in my head that it's hard for me to make a step forward to do not just that, but with almost everything in my life. Um, so I am working on that. I'm working on me. And, and don't think that I don't care about you, the listeners. Don't think I don't care about OTP. Um, this is the the one of my biggest accomplishments in my life, to have almost 2 million followers, to be coming up on a million YouTube subscribers, to get the numbers that I get listening to these shows. Like This is one of my proudest accomplishments in life. So just know that I don't take it lightly. Um, and it is not just this podcast that it has this effect on. It, it's really an issue with me as a person. And it is an issue that I'm working to resolve. But um, yeah, so I do apologize for the breaks. I apologize for not doing the show as I should, I apologize for not doing a Monday and a Tuesday show. I apologize for not uh, having guests on like we used to have in the past. Um, it is something I'm very cognizant of. So I guess the, the whole sum of this thing is don't think that I don't care. Don't think that uh, I'm doing it just to spite somebody or I'm doing it because I'm lazy or I'm doing it because any of this. It, it's really something that weighs on me every day of my life. Like every time I don't do one of these shows, Trust me, I go all week long thinking about it. Um, Mondays and Tuesdays just live live in anxiety about how I'm going to manage to get myself to do this show. How am I going to manage to talk into a microphone? How am I going to get the cur or the to put everything together to go through the storylines to talk about it? I mean, you heard me just fall apart a second ago as I was right in the middle of a, of a spiel. Um, but yeah, so. Sorry if this part of the show bored you. Sorry if this part you're rolling your eyes at. Sorry if any of you think any less of me as a person now. Um, but like I said, if you made it this far in the show, you are a core listener. If you are a core listener, you deserve to have some sort of explanation about the show's spottiness. And uh, that is the that is the best that I can offer you. And it's a little bit of vulnerability for me. And it's not, it's not an excuse. You might hear it as an excuse. 
Um, like I said, it's not just the podcast. It, it trickles to a lot more things that I have going on right now. Um, not to mention my brother lived me six brain surgeries this year. My dad, two neck surgeries going in for another neck surgery. Um, October 3rd, actually, which is my mom's birthday. Um, and there's some other stuff. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the point of was this, but, uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully, uh, I <laughs> didn't put you off as a listener. Um, yeah, I will do everything I can to be better at this, but thank you for listening. Thank you for the support. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening to OTP. Love each and every single one of you. As I mentioned, um, we got this thing going. We got this thing going. OTP is going. I just got to figure out how to get the max return out of it and how to do it the way that you all deserve for it to be done. Because like I said, I'm a huge fan of this sport. I know that you are all huge fans of this sport. And I know that OTP fills a hole that is much needed in the sport. I just got to figure out how to do that on a more consistent basis. So... Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in to On The Pipe Podcast. Sorry about it, but uh, we'll see you next time. See you.